afternoon. It is 1 p.m. and we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm excited because we have a lot of valuable material to cover today. My name is Johnny Hollis and I am a nurse with the Florida Department of Health here at Children's Medical Services. And we are on part four of our five-part compassion fatigue vicarious trauma series. And today we're talking about self-awareness and staying on top of our stressful and challenging life. Forgive me, my computer's being slow and advancing to the next slide. There we go. Um, I've asked everyone to please mute your line so we don't have feedback. We will be using the chat box um, a lot today in some of our activities. Um, and if you've missed any of our previous webinars, we do have sessions available for you. I have the link on the um, screen, but Angela at the end of this is also going to send this PowerPoint out. So you'll have all the links and the online resources that we're going to be exploring today. We want your feedback, regardless if you need CEUs or not, which you give us in your feedback helps us make um, this presentation um, better and better. So please uh, follow that survey link, and that's something that Angela will also send out at the end of this, and let us know um, what you think we can improve on and what you think we might be doing well. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the objectives, but they're up there. Uh, for you to review and I'm just going to get right into the meat of the material because like I said I'm excited and we've got a lot of stuff to cover today. So uh, we always review what we learned previously in case uh, any of you missed a session or weren't able to join us. So I'm going to quickly do a little bit of our review from our previous webinars. So um, first compassion fatigue is that deep erosion of our compassion. It's that um, inability over time to tolerate that strong emotional and difficult stories in others. It's a normal occupational hazard in the helping field. It really is a side effect of doing a good job, but it is experienced by those who help others in distress, and it does affect our own physical, emotional, social health, and well-being. When we talk about vicarious trauma, that is where we hear difficult stories over and over again, hundreds of stories that over time start to change our view of the world. And while we might not have experienced that trauma firsthand, our exposure to these stories actually can help cause what caused a secondary trauma or vicarious trauma. We've also talked about burnout. It's a physical and emotional exhaustion that results in um, having prolonged frustration and stress, and it actually um, makes us unable um, in our ability to cope with work demands. It creates feelings of powerlessness to achieve our goals. The difference between compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma, and burnout is that burnout can happen in any occupation. It can happen um, in you know, the hospitality, hospitality industry or restaurant workers, where when we look at compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma, that is for those who are in the helping professions that it really can affect and does affect. Um, we've got uh, experts that say um, that we're we can't expect that it will affect us. The statistics show that it does affect us. We can only hope to use strategies to help overcome and or minimize the results of compassion, fatigue, and vicarious trauma. So as individuals, not only does compassion, fatigue, and vicarious trauma affect us, but it also affects our organizations and our workplace. And that's where we spent a little bit more of our time last week with talking about strategies to help um, overcome compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma in the workplace. Um, does anyone remember, please use your chat box now, does anyone remember what we meant by the uh, must be nice phenomenon? Can you give me an example of a must be nice?
Okay, so um, I had an example last week of a must be nice. Um, here at our organization, we offer they offer an exercise class on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it is on a lunch hour, and I just found out about it. And so I had put it on my schedule, and I was carving out that time, and I was making my self-care a priority that week. And I went ahead and brought in my yoga mat to do it. And when I walked in that morning, someone said, oh, are you going to take a nap in your office today? And I smiled and said, no, I'm excited. We're gonna, I'm going to do the exercise class at lunchtime. And they said, well, I have to work through my lunch. I don't get to take a lunch time. So that's an example of a must be nice. And must be nice, we have to remember that if we love ourselves, we are going to do self-care. Self-care is self-love. And when we have feelings that are negative of someone else's self-care strategy, that really is an indicative of an envy or a longing on our part. I remember I had a must be nice response, you know, when I saw uh, people in my other organization taking time out for themselves for self-care and I felt like I didn't have the time to do that. So it's important that we strategize and carve out how we can do things differently to take better care of ourselves and we're going to be really enforcing that to today with today's um, webinar. The other thing we talked about was our BMW. Um, B stands for witching with the B. The M is a moaning and uh, the W is whining. So what we know about our BMWs is that it really doesn't accomplish anything. It's not productive. It's not good problem solving. And instead, it can create a toxic environment. So it's good um, when we are around others that are um, complaining and not contributing to make positive changes that we actually remove ourselves from the situation. That is what we have control and power over, removing ourselves, and that can actually significantly improve our work experience um, and how we perceive things um, in the world. So my next question to you, if I could get some great people to give me some feedback, did anyone experiment with the low impact disclosure strategies that we talked about last month? Did anyone feel that they were able to properly debrief with their colleagues or their supervisors without sliming them by using low impact disclosure? Awesome, Rita. Thank you for your comment. Do you feel like you were able to properly debrief? Because I want everyone to remember it is so important for us to debrief. That is actually what keeps us healthy as helpers. All we're saying is just be careful in how you are debriefing, making sure that you have permission from your coworker ahead of time. Let them know, I'd like to debrief with you. Is this a good time to debrief? So that gives them fair warning where they can say, yes, I'm available, or no, I'm not. It also, you know, you can say what the situation is about, so you can make sure that that's not a trigger for them. Um, and then once you've got their consent, then we really um, had that visual uh, picture up before of those concentric circles that you start to be free from those outer circles, giving you know, the limited amount of information, especially any traumatic or, you know, gory or horrific details, that still gives you the benefit of having that debriefing process without actually um, traumatizing the person that you're debriefing with. Awesome, Reed. I'm so glad for that feedback. Did you ask you, did you explain to your supervisor what you had learned and what you're trying to accomplish? And had she heard of this strategy? And is it easier for you to unmute your line, Rita, and tell us yeah. more than welcome? Um, I didn't really ask her about um, the, the process, um, but I did ask her if it was okay if I could debrief with her first. And um, it worked out well. Good, good, good. Did you find yourself limiting some of the information that you gave her as you would have done previously? No, I, I think I was really open about the situation. Okay, good. All right. 
and so you felt better as a result of having debriefed with her. Was that a real traumatic story? Was there any gory details that you feel like you could have left out and still had that debriefing uh, benefit? No, it was it it was no, it, there wasn't anything gory or anything. But um, um, I could have I probably could have vented more, but um, or expressed my feelings more. But it 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 was okay. And I, 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 there was a relief after the debrief. Good. Well, I'm so glad that you had that relief after the debrief. The debrief. That's an excellent, again, important strategy for being healthy as, as helpers. So um, last time we also uh, did a dragon exercise. Did anyone share with their colleagues or with their organization the dragon activity? While we're waiting for. Um, feedback in the chat or if you want to, we'll continue to try to unmute our lines if we don't get feedback or echoing noise. We'll see how that works. That dragon activity was part of the, what we're going to further delve into with our self-awareness. So it's so important for us to be self-aware as a strategy to help overcome compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma. So that dragon last week represented our self-awareness when we get into that yellow-red zone of our Compassion fatigue continuum. Oh, Angela, good. Did you find um? What did you think about the dragon activity? Was that helpful? I mean, at the time, yes, it was. And um, I mean, because we were listening to the webinar, you know, so it was sort of part of the the whole exercise. Um, I mean, we weren't using, in a sense, um, the uh, it the as a way at the time to relieve stress or anything like that, it was it was just done as part of the exercise. But people enjoy doing it. I mean, people have enjoyed um, having either you know the mandala at the time to to do while they're listening to the webinars. And again, the dragon is more reflective of a self awareness, re recognizing our signs and symptoms when we're really starting to let chronic stress or compassion fatigue. Um, really start to take over for us. So that actually brings us into, thank you everyone for sharing, I appreciate that, and it brings us into talking more about how we can combat compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma and improve our healthiness. So I've said it before, I'll say it again, if we're in the helping profession, we're at risk. In fact, most Experts say it can't be prevented, that we are going to have it at one period of our career or another. So all we can really do is work to limit and overcome the effects. And we do this improved uh, self-awareness, but we also do this by um, reducing chronic stress. And that's what we're going to focus on today. We've got to work at recognizing and work towards regulating our internal levels of stress to help us cope with our highly challenging, complex lives that we have. It's not just our jobs, it's our lives um, <laughs> intermixed and infused with our job that makes us very challenging. And many helpers report that they can't recall the last time that they feel relaxed. Please use your chat box. Does this resonate with any of you? When was the last time that you felt relaxed, that you recall feeling relaxed? Does anyone want to be brave and say when was the last time that you recall feeling relaxed? When we previously discussed the oh Christmas vacation, oh that's about four months ago. Wow. Oh, that's a great self care strategy, Nancy. Working in your garden, awesome. Good, good, good. Because remember, we've talked about previously the effects of chronic stress on our body, and those effects can be physical, emotional, and psychological. And the way our body works 
we can only start to repair the damage that stress causes, and it does cause damage, sometimes irreparable damage. We can only repair this damage if we're properly engaged in rest um, and also with digestion. When we're worried, we're hurried, we're fearful, we're angry, or we're anxious, we cannot work on repairing the damage that stress does to our body. So now we're going to look a little bit deeper on how we can improve our self-awareness and some other strategies that help us combat and reduce our chronic stress. So let's first talk what do we mean when we say self-awareness? Let's use your chat box. When you think of self-awareness, what do you think of? What do you think it means? I'm not letting you guys uh, color on your mandala today, am I? <laughs> I'm asking you to give me too many comments. So what do you think we mean by self-awareness? Seeing how you feel. Seeing how you feel. Absolutely. Being aware of our current feelings. It's a, it is that conscious knowledge of our own character, feelings, our motives, and our desires. It's our being aware of our current feelings and our actions as well as our reactions. It's being in tune with our stress signals. Um, Dr. Gaber Mate, who's the author of When the Body Says No, emphasizes the importance of self-awareness, not only being aware of our current feelings and actions and reactions, but aware of how our past experiences impact the choices that we make every day. And according to Dr. Mate, we actually need to understand and be aware of how we deal with hurt, anger, and resentment there is a definite link between our emotional state and our physical health, and pushing away our emotions plays havoc on our immune system. Getting to know ourselves inside and out is a continuous journey, like peeling back individual layers on an onion. And getting in touch with our emotions and tendencies actually takes honesty and courage. So when we have self-awareness and we are in tune with our stress signals, we have a better understanding of how our body communicates with us when we're overwhelmed. Many of us live in a constant state of overload and are barely aware of it. Being self-aware also means understanding how our past influences our current life and our current choices. It also means understanding how our own childhood history affects our reactions to our client's stories. It also means being aware of the ways that in which we ourselves sabotage our own self-care by saying yes to things our schedule doesn't allow for, or by taking on more responsibilities when our plate is already over full, also by indulging in alcohol, food, and other excessive habits that aren't good for you, including binge watching TV and uh, excessive shopping and things like that. So I want, I'm giving you my disclaimer right now. I'm very sensitive to the challenging lives that you as our family health leaders lead. And I understand many of you are doing the best that you can do with what you have. I myself have personally struggled with self-care over the years, and I know how easy it is to say to take care of yourself and I also understand the obstacles and challenges and the barriers that we have to overcome in actually making ourselves a priority and doing a better job in taking care of ourselves. I'm strongly encouraging, I'm actually imploring 
that you take stock and in the next hour, part of our hour, see what 1% changes you can make in the strategies that we're going to discuss today to improve our self-care. Because it really not only means your health and wellness, but it also means our lives. And there's science that shows that when we're not taking care of ourselves, when we're letting adrenaline and anxiety and chronic stress overrun us, that we're killing off cells that actually shorten our lifespan and decrease our life expectancy. Not trying to scare you, but actually I am. I want you to be motivated into action because we've got to do something different than what we're currently doing in order to take care of ourselves better. So let's talk a little bit about what's fueling you. Our next stop in self-awareness is discussing primary self-care strategies that properly fuel our bodies. We absolutely need energy every day in order for us to focus, to take consistent action, and to fully live our lives. And there are different types of fuels that give us energy. We've got some fuels that are better than others. So fuels like exercise, nutrition food, love and support, those are fuels that are slow burning and last over time. But then we've got other fuels like adrenaline, caffeine, sugar, and anxiety. And they might provide an intense burst of energy, but they put our health at risk. It's the difference of comparing gasoline, which is that slow burning, it lasts over time, with rocket fuel, which gives us an immediate powerful boost, but then quickly burns us out. So yes, both types of energy get the job done, but only one supports our long-term physical, emotional, and spiritual health. So I know this is a busy slide, and I don't want you to look at it. I want you to be listening to me, and I want you to take out, turn your Mandela over. This is a book. This um, test comes from the book, Take Time for Your Life by Shell Richardson. And this is a test, Are You Running on Adrenaline? And I'm going to read each question out loud. And as I read each question out loud, I want you to put a mark or check if that applies to you. So the first question, so again, I'm reading each question. You're going to put a mark or a check if that applies to you, and then we're going to count our check marks in the end. So the first one, do you consistently overcommit yourself personally and professionally? Do you double book social engagement? Are you usually late for appointments? Do you repeatedly check your voicemail or email throughout the day? Is your schedule so full that there's no time left for you? Do you feel lost without your cell phone, your laptop, or your iPad? Do you put things off to the last minute or use tight deadlines to get things done? Do you usually speed when driving? Does it seem like your car's fuel gauge is always on or near empty? Do you live on the edge financially? Do you always feel pressed for time? Do you put off making decisions or taking action in spite of anxiety it causes? Does the thought of being bored make you nervous and uncomfortable? If the phone rings and you are involved in something, do you answer it anyway? Do you wake in the middle of the night with thoughts racing, unable to sleep? Do you juggle several projects at once? Are you constantly coming up with a new idea to pursue? Do you often forget to follow through on commitments? Now I want you to count up your marks. Anyone brave enough to put their marks on the chat box? So if you answered yes to five or more questions, you may be running on adrenaline. These types of behaviors from these questions that I just read are behaviors that cause anxiety. 
And when we have a constant hum of anxiety, it pumps adrenaline into our body. So how many of you are thinking things like, tight deadlines help motivate me to get things done? Or, when I keep my schedule full, it keeps me pumped, ready to go, and on my toes. That's the problem with breaking this adrenaline habit, is that the adrenaline feels exhilarating, and we easily mistake it as good sources of energy. However, adrenaline is very sneaky in that its negative effects build up over time, and as I said before, it actually kills cells that can never rejuvenate. Also, according to Lempinski back in 2009, when we keep ourselves numbed out on adrenaline or overworking or cynicism, we do not have an accurate internal gauge of ourselves. So our self-awareness is skewed when we keep ourselves numbed out on adrenaline. I want to applaud those of you that um, I, like many of you on there, when I took this test, I scored over eight. And it really has given me pause for thought. And I used to actually say I'm a NICU nurse. That's my background. And I would love it when that light would go on and your adrenaline would kick in. And I used to say I'm an adrenaline junkie because I love that feeling. And as I'm getting older, I'm realizing the sacrifice that my body is making as a result of me living um, on constant stress, on constant anxiety, because I, I do some of these very things that are on this test. So I'm really looking at myself and what I can do to change, because I know from everything that I've read and learned, if I stop now and change this habit, and if I focus on these premium fuels for my body, I'll have better concentration, better productivity, and a better life. And we're going to talk more about that. I don't know about you guys, but I like hope. So when I find things that give me hope, I get excited. Okay, so how do we kick this bad adrenaline habit that's so hard to kick? Well, um, first we need to try to always arrive early. So when we're scheduling appointments, and I'd like to encourage this for meetings too, I actually um, Work, I'm recently working with a leadership coach, and that was one of the strategies that she gave for me with my meetings to add space before and after the allotted time. So for an example, if you're booking an appointment and it's from 1 to 2, walk out 12.30 to 2.30. If it's a meeting, maybe schedule 15 minutes before and then 15 minutes after. Can you imagine the benefit of being able to review the materials needed for the meeting, come go to the bathroom ahead of time, have your materials that you need, and then sit afterwards, put the things back in your file folder, make the notes that you needed, send the follow-up tasks that need to be done. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? Wouldn't that give you energy that came from a centered and peaceful place? And that's what will happen if we put this practice in our lives. We'll notice that we have more energy because that energy has come from us being more centered and more at peace. It's also very important that we develop a daily relaxation practice. And when I got feedback from the self-awareness surveys after webinar two, that is something that our family health leaders are definitely struggling with is making sure that they're taking their breaks and they're developing that daily relaxation practice. Remember before you had, um, I gave you that resource for the just take two minutes. Um, other mindfulness activities I've seen say you can just take one minute, you know, several times a day and that will have good effects for you. We're going to do a couple of relaxation techniques um, later on in our webinar today, if a time allows. So relaxation comes in many forms. Later on, I provided you a lot of free online resources. There's also guided relaxation CDs. There's podcasts. Cast. There's apps for our phone. We can take long baths. We can color. We can have Play-Doh in our hands. All sorts of different things to help us 
we lack. So pick the best form that works for you. So when we talk about, um, we know in our challenging lives we have constant interruptions, and those interruptions raise our stress levels and keep our bodies braced for more. It's almost like those uh, that fight fight mechanism. So we're always just kind of loaded for bear, and we've got that you know constant stress level. So I want to encourage you, and I know this can be hard when you're juggling multiple roles. You've got lots of competing demands. People are constantly coming to you. Your families need you. Your boss needs you. Your colleagues need you. But try to find time to block out, especially when you need focus and concentration to finish work. Talk to your colleagues or your boss beforehand. Let them know that you're going to block you know, so much time out, make sure it's okay with them, negotiate time, how much and how often that you can actually block some time out, put a do not disturb sign on your door, and turn off your auto preview on email so that you can be more focused on the task at hand. If you're able to, turn off that ringer on your phone too, because the gift of silence can also be a wonderful source of energy. Visual clarity is also very important. So clearing our clutter in our office and in our homes can actually help with sensory overload. So we talked about blocking off time, especially when we need to concentrate on important projects or assignments or reports and we're trying to get things done. But it really is a good habit for us to actually schedule blocks of time for certain tasks. When you talk about people that are really efficient and organized in the way they and what they do and you talk with them, a lot of them use this strategy. They actually plan specific times that they're going to make all of their phone calls or certain times where they're going to handle all of their paperwork or certain times when they're going to do all their client interviews. So when we schedule blocks of time, we don't have to keep switching and juggling from that task to task, which further fragments us and pull at our energy. Instead, we can actually get our work done faster, and it will help reduce that adrenaline because we're not in that ju constant juggling mode. So routine and structure equals focused energy. And it's that adrenaline that actually keeps us disconnected from our feelings, which are the very things that help to make our lives rich. Okay, so this is where you might want to be beating me up, and I just want to keep giving you my disclaimer. I know this is easier to say and much harder to do, but we've got to talk about the benefits of fueling your body because, again, that's what kicks this adrenaline habit. Exercise, I call it a triple prong benefit because not only does it fuel our body, but it also fuels our mind and our spirit. So we get like a a, a, a trifecta benefit just from exercise. It's important that we make exercise interesting and fun to help keep us motivated. And if we get bored easily, we've got to make sure that we vary that routine. You don't have to go to the gym every day. Instead, take a walk outside, ride your bike the next day, do a day where you're hot, skipping, jumping, go for a hike or go to the park. Throw a frisbee, play catch. There's so many different things out, out there that helps us get the physical activity, helps us raise our heart to help have the benefits of our heart rate, to help have the benefits of exercise. We need to stop thinking of exercise as an option, but we all, we need to actually make it a mandatory daily part of our self-care routine, like brushing our teeth. How long would we go without brushing our teeth? Well, we need to make sure we're not going that long without exercising. So not only does exercise help us with maintaining our healthy weight and building stronger bones, but it gives us increased energy, it improves our mood, it gives us that mental clarity and focus, and it helps us sleep better at night. Plus, when we exercise regularly, we don't have to feel guilty and beat ourselves up because we aren't exercising. So that's a win-win, too. 
Um, those self-assessments that were done and submitted after our second webinar, they actually consistently show that this is a missing key ingredient for our family health leaders. So I really want to encourage you to think about one change you can make with exercise and, and start committing to doing that. Along with exercise, other things that fuel our body includes pampering. Pampering can be whether you're getting a pedicure or a manicure, chiropractic care or massage. It all those things help us to restore our balance, improve our circulation, and increase our energy. Again, this was another area that our family health leaders scored very low on. And I get it, for me, a massage is a luxury. Uh, it's not only a time luxury, but it's also money luxury. So check in. We've got some of those institutes um, around the state that are, you know, masseuses in training, and you can get um, a reduced massage. You know, talk to your significant honey uh, or significant other. I sometimes pay my uh, daughter uh, money to give me a little massage. So. Think about other creative ways that, or at work, you know, give each other. Oh, we used to do this in the NICU on our break. Uh, well, when it was uh, our baby sleep time, we would um, take 10 minutes and rotate giving each other a little shoulder massage in our chair. So those aren't things that cost money. We just have to carve out the time to do it. All right, so sleep is as important as food, water, and exercise. And again, sleep was something that everyone uh, reported that they struggle with. Sleep tips include making sure that your bedroom is a sanctuary. Don't work in your bed. Don't watch TV in your bed. The only thing you should be using your bed for is sleep and your intimacy with your partner. You need to make use white noise or nature sounds to help eliminate unwanted noise. Make sure that your room is dust free and your air filters are regularly changed. We need to be keeping plugged in items at least three feet away from our bed. There's an actual uh, electromagnetic radiation that comes off of those and I recently, I did not know that and I uh, was, it lives really close to my bed and um, and doing some research and finding that out, I have moved those a little far further away. Let's go to bed when we feel tired. Let's don't um, uh, talk about not watching TV or working in bed. In fact, it's actually best to turn off screen times one to two hours before bedtime. And if we're not doing that as an adult, we need to really strongly be making sure our children are doing that too because it is um, that, that stimuli that keeps them up and um, affects their ability to go to bed on time. If you have difficulty falling asleep, take a hot bath. You can listen to music with your eyes closed, talk to your loved ones, or read a book. But don't read it on your Kindle because that light will stimulate you and interfere with your sleep cycle. So uh, breathing is another important uh, tool for our body. We tend to breathe shallow in our upper chest, but our body actually needs deep breathing for full oxygenation and energy. The simple act of breathing down into our bellies can instantly make us feel more relaxed yet alive. Let's try it right now. Let's take a slow, deep breath into our belly so our stomach moves outward and expand. We're going to breathe in through the nose while breathing in and pushing out our bellies. We are counting to four. We hold for a count of eight. And then we slowly breathe out through our nose for a count of two. So let's do that again. We're taking a slow deep breath in through our belly. Count of four. Hold it for eight. And release for two. Do it again on your own. In through your belly for a count of four. Hold it for a pause of eight. Breathe out for two. Notice how you feel. Another breathing technique to try is to try to breathe all the way to our toes. So when you're taking that deep breath, visualize all that oxygen from that breath going and traveling down into your toes and coming back up. 
deep breathing is a great exercise that we can do sitting at our desk. We can do it while we're waiting at that red light or before going to sleep. So don't forget to breathe and to breathe deep. All right, fueling our mind. There's lots of things that help us fuel our minds, like partaking in stimulating conversations, learning new things, reading a book, which was another area that was scored low on our self-assessment. But the most powerful fuel for our mind is our thoughts. Thoughts become intention, and intention has power. And when we put our intention out in the world, change starts to happen. This is a basic metaphysical law. So now I actually want you to take out your Mandela, and on the back side of it, I want you to write a few simple goals that you would like to attract in the upcoming year. Try to be specific, but three simple goals that I want you to write down. At the end of this webinar, I want you to transfer those goals onto a 3 by 5 card and I want you to keep them with you so that you can glance at them throughout the day. I want you to actually visualize and imagine yourself already having these things. Don't get focused on the results, just be mindful of them. So again, you're writing down three specific goals on your piece of paper, and then you're later going to transfer them to your 3 by 5 card. While you're writing those goals and finishing those up, the author of Taking Time for Your Life, Cheryl Richardson, in her book provided multiple examples of her doing this with her clients that yield fruitful results as a result of their positive intention and that metaphysical law of putting your positive thoughts out there and then things starting to change as a result of them. So as we're wrapping up your goals, it's also important that we're thinking high quality thoughts. We have to pay attention to what we say to ourselves. We have a tendency to be very hard on ourselves and our own worst critique. Critics, excuse me. This was something that also came out in our self-care assessments that were submitted that there was um, a need for us to be more positive with our self-affirmations. Negative self-talk serves no purpose, and it's actually very debilitating. So anytime we catch ourselves thinking things like, I'm not good enough, or I never do anything right, we need to immediately stop and replace those with a positive statement or a positive affirmation. I would like now for you guys to think about positive affirmations. Oh, Julie, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to get to your comments in a minute. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention to the chat, the, um, chat box. So uh, three goals, just three goals that you would like to see happen in the future. Um, maybe you want to reduce your hours at work. Maybe you want to lose 25 pounds. So think about what your three goals are, be specific with them, and um, you're going to write them down, and you're going to uh, transfer them to a 3 by 5 card, and then you're going to keep that card with you constantly. Maybe it's on top of your desk, maybe it's in your purse, but you're going to look at that card regularly throughout the day. We're not going to pay attention to the results next week, does that mean we're going to lose 25 pounds? No. But we're going to be mindful of it, and we're going to see what happens as a result. There were tremendous positive experiences um, with people who have participated in this type of activity, including, you know, buying a new house, um, you know, getting their new computer. So I'm not just talking about little things. I'm talking about the power, this metaphysical law that can really bring about change as we put positive thoughts into the world and then we're mindful of them and we keep refreshing and constantly going back over and looking at our goals and, and being aware of them. So now I want us to think about a positive affirmation. So what would you say, and please use your chat box, what would you say to your loved one or a client that you valued that was being negative with themselves? What positive affirmation would you give to them to help them overcome? And if you see a positive affirmation that resonates with you, I want you to write that down now. 
So what we're doing is we are looking for our own self-loving mantra. So for example, instead of saying I'm not good enough when I'm struggling with something and I can't get it, I'm going to stop and I'm going to say I deeply and profoundly accept myself. That would be my self-loving mantra. Remember, they have a Saturday Night Live skit on this where he, he looks in the mirror and what did he say? I'm beautiful, I love myself, and I'm good enough, you know. So I know they made a spoof on it, but it's true. We've got to have positive self-talk to replace this negative self-talk. So give me some suggestions in the chat box. Um, and I'm going to, uh, while you're doing that, it's these positive statements that help shift our body's energy field into a balanced state that actually improves immune function. You are a good person. That's right. So you're, um, good one, Angela. Thank you. I am a caring person. Awesome. Yeah, so when I'm feeling I'm not good enough and I'm not getting it done, I can think about, I am a good person. I'm a caring person. So I want you to write your positive self mantra on the back side of your 3 by 5 card. So write it down on your piece of paper today, and then after the webinar, your goal statement is going to be on the front side of your 3 by 5 card and your positive self-affirmation, your self-love statement is going to be on the back side. Oh, awesome, Julie. The world needs your uniqueness. Ah, I love that. Good job. Yes, trust your inner self. That's a good one. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so another strategy to fuel our mind is inspirational material. So these can be affirmation books. This can be displaying visual message, words like joy, love, faith, has power, subliminal effect on our mind. Um, we need to keep it simple. Don't clutter our space with these words, um, but you know, and change them out over time to help keep us inspired. So it's also um, important uh, that we turn off the junk. So what do I mean by the junk? We've got to make conscious choices with what we read and what we watch. How many of you get that physical reaction where your hair is standing on edge, your heart rate increases, or you get that gut reaction from watching a horrific tragedy in the news? When we see visually disturbing images, then we get that physical response. What do we think it's doing to our emotional health? So if we become more self-aware and connected to our feelings, we can actually help protect ourselves from this negative fuel. Um, I'm going to move on because I want to make sure we get to another one of our activities and fueling our spirit. Think about music and music that makes us happy and puts us in our happy place. Think about making some playlists of your favorite music for when you're getting down or frustrated. Make sure that we're using our laugh therapy with our friends, that we're watching movies that, or shows that make us laugh, even if it is reruns. And sometimes we just need that good old-fashioned cry. And if you need help crying, watching a sad movie will sometimes help. Crying can actually clear out the mind and rejuvenate the spirit and re-energize that body. So the next technique we're going to talk about is mindful-based stress reduction. And basically, this slide says there's a lot of research that it shows on numerous conditions and that it really can transform the way that we relate our lives. They use this in pain management, blood pressure management, depression, and there's research that shows that there's significant improvement in compassion fatigue. The literature actually says that it can uh, mindful-based stress reduction can slow our aging process, increase our focus and creativity, and help to reclaim our lives. So there's three main strategies when we talk about mindful-based stress reduction. And I've included a lot of online resources on the slide 
for you to not take my word for it, but go out there and see the benefits that mindful-based stress reduction has. There's three basic components. One is sitting meditation, and this don't when you think of meditation, don't be thinking, you know, Buddha or the monks, and you gotta sit on the floor and it's an hour. No, we can do meditation in our chair, and we can do it in uh, 10 minutes. There's this awesome app, Headspace app, uh, that takes 10 minutes a day, and it walks you through um, great meditation. There's some challenges that your mind will you'll have to overcome, um, and this TED Talk that I have listed talks about those challenges with your mind wanting to wander and you have to bring it back with you feeling bored and fidgety, but really meditation is the key to helping reduce anxiety, reduce stress, and focus, create, increase focus, creativity, and all those other positive benefits. I wanted to take a minute and do this body scan. I'm not a minute. We're going to take three minutes. The body scan is one of the other key strategies of the mindful-based stress reduction, as well as yoga. So we're going to, in the next few minutes, do a body scan, and then we're going to do a yoga pose. So this website has this three-minute body scan meditation that we're going to do right now. Begin by bringing your attention into your body. You can close your eyes that's comfortable to you. You can notice your body seated wherever you're seated, feeling the weight of your body on the chair, on the floor. And take a few deep breaths. And as you take a deep breath, bring in more oxygen enlivening the body. And as you exhale, have a sense of relaxing more deeply. You can notice your feet on the floor. Notice the sensations of your feet touching the floor, the weight and pressure, vibration, heat. You can notice your legs against the chair, pressure, pulsing, heaviness. Lightness. Notice your back against the chair. Bring your attention into your stomach area. If your stomach is tense or tight, let it soften. Take a breath. Notice your hands. Are your hands tense or tight? See if you can allow them to soften. Notice your arms. Feel any sensations in your arms. Let your shoulders be soft. Notice your neck and throat. Let them be soft, relaxed. Soften your jaw. Let your face and facial muscles be soft. And notice your whole body present. Take one more breath. Be aware of your whole body as best you can. Take a breath. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes. I hate to disturb you from that relaxation. What do you guys think about that? Is that something you think you can incorporate into your day every day? So again, the body scan is a very effective exercise from the field of relaxation, training, and stress. Um, the full version of the body scan actually encourages you to focus on each part of your body, one after the other, to identify where you're holding the attention. 
The process is normally done lying down in a quiet room, but as you can see, there's modified versions to help us whether we're at our desk or in the car. So in the last five minutes, I want us to uh, do a yoga pose. So there's lots of different yoga poses out there. You can go on Pinterest and they have instructions for you. You can just Google yoga and uh, Yoga is so good for us for stretching, it's so good for our posture, but it also helps enhance that mindful awareness of our body and balance and strengthen our musculoskeletal system. So the pose that we're going to do today is called the mountain pose. It is one of the basic poses. So if you can, at the area that you're at, please um, stand with your feet together. This mountain pose helps us work on our posture. If you're with other people, make sure that you're at least arms width apart. So we're going to stand with our feet together and our shoulders relax. We're going to let our arms hang at our side. We're going to inhale deeply. And as we're inhaling deeply, we're going to raise our hands over our head with our palms facing each other. So again, we close our hands over our head, and our palms are facing each other. We're going to reach towards the sky, and we're going to hold that pose for 30 seconds. We're going to breathe normally, and we're going to exhale as we lower our arms back down to our side. So again, the mountain pose is typically the starting position for other standing poses. Other common yoga uh, poses are the tree, the down, downward facing dog, bridge, a seated twist. Um, staff pose. So please, please look at those resources that I have um, included on this slide for you. In fact, that is your homework. So I would like for everyone, and Angela's going to email this out right at the end of our session today. She already has it. Um, so not only are we going to complete our 3 by 5 card, I'd like you to spend an hour, I'm asking for one hour of your time in the next 30 days, reviewing the free online resources that I've given to you on that on this previous slide. Um, I think it's really important that you get more familiar with what we mean by mindful-based stress reduction and start incorporating some of those components in your life. This is, even if you're only starting with being more aware and mindful of that moment instead of, you know, ruminating on the past or being worried about the future, really focusing on that moment as a way to help break this adrenaline cycle, as a way for us to be more self-aware, and as a way for us to better take care of ourselves. Any questions in the last couple minutes we have before we end? Again, we want your feedback, so please um, complete our evaluation. Okay, so I'm getting some, I'm not going to pronounce it, Joanne. You want to say what it is out loud? It's key gone, and it's a type of meditation, a self-guided meditation. The app on the phone has different meditations, audios with different intentions, and it's quite helpful. Some of them are very short. Some of them are quite long. It depends on your comfort, but it's helpful to have uh, uh, the audio to guide you through the meditation. Awesome. That's a free app? Yes, it's a free app. Awesome. And there's tons yeah. of them on the phone, yes. Yes, thank you, Angela. She's got on the chat box, Angela has her... Um, email address so that if uh, you didn't get the follow-up email from her to email her, she is A as in Apple, M as in Mary, I, N as in Nancy, E, Y, at P, D, E, B, S, dot, 
ufl.edu. Yes, thank you, Angela. My host is with the Mosa. She keeps me uh, focused and on track because, um, yes, I'm an adrenaline junkie and I wait for the last minute so I can have focus. But I'm trying to stop that terrible habit and uh, do a better job of taking care of myself. And I want you guys to commit to doing 1% change to take better care of yourself um, during this next month. And we'll check in with each other again next month. And in the meantime, I hope you have a great rest of your weekend, a relaxing weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.